Go kubi ji so gin gin shi kai takamani ni kamu tmai mui de masu. Go murugi kamurumi no maji kara maji te. Bangse to eto no mio ya kamu matsu sano mai kari o mikami. Harido no kamu taji. More more no saka kato tsumai no tsutsumi ki gari o ba mai kari mote. Arai ki o me misugi tsumai te kimono kono chikara yimi ge wese tsumai to. Motsu koto no yoshi o kashimi kashimi mo matsu. Miyamo no sumai kori o mikami mamuri tsumi e sugi o i tsumai e. Gom nagara tsumai ji aimatsu. Gom nagara tsumai ji aimatsu. Kam nagara tsumai ji haimase. Welcome to Journey into the Mystic, a podcast where we uncover the powerful intersections between the mystical and eros. Eros is that which connects. Each episode delves into themes of liberation, healing, and connection guiding those seeking deeper self-understanding and richer relationships. We explore practices and philosophies that unlock new dimensions of being, diving deep into mystical states and their significance for personal growth and well-being. Mystical states are marked by and defined as profound changes in perception, thought, and emotion, offer experiences of unity, timelessness, and deep insight whether induced by meditation, prayer, psychedelics, orgasmic meditation, or spontaneous occurrences, these states evoke feelings of transcendence and profound connection. Join us as we explore the path to the mystical state through in-depth discussions, interviews, personal stories, offering insight, inspiration, challenges, and of course, humor at every turn. I am your host, Rachel Pelletier, an 18-year erotic practitioner and explorer of the mystical states. Today, I am excited to welcome my dear friends, Ashel, Seasons, Eldridge, and Sochil Bernadette Marino. Ashel, Chicago-born, living in Oakland now by way of New York, he is West African Blackfoot ancestry. He has been working internationally with various shamanic practices since 2005. His ceremonial leadership includes Dagagra and ancestral healing, Japanese spiritual purification and galactic language activation, soul cleansing via Tia Gong. He is the co-founder and co-director of Esfera, Umbrella for Essential Food and Medicine, Celestial Church, and Earth Amplified, creating liberation through restoring ecosystems, regenerating communities, retelling stories, and remembering our divinity. The work spans from recovery support from addiction with the Oakland Unhoused, to indigenous international hip hop, to elemental activism, including rights of repair, Tantra, transformative justice, quantum physics, and divination. So Chiel Bernadette Moreno is a longtime activist and media maker and creator. She is the co-host and producer of KPFA Radio's La Onda Baita and co-founder and co-director of Essential Food and Medicine, who re-indigenizes our community's relationship to the land, food and medicine, working with the houseless, indigenous, and formerly incarcerated. She is a ceremonialist who works in the healing arts. As a collaborator with Celestial Church, she combines medicines and sacred traditions from her own ancestral Mexican-Australian lineages with various paths from the places she has traveled to study. She blends music, clinical herbalism, bodywork, and curanderism to create balance. Welcome, my friends. I thought we could start by 
how each of you individually began your journey and then how the two of you met. And then I would love if you would tell people about the project that you guys do, the essential food and medicine, and we can go, for, we can go for, we'll start there and we'll see what I'm doing. <clears throat> Sounds good. Yeah. Hi, Michelle. <laughs> hey. <laughs> um, great. Who wants to go first? You start. Okay. I'll yeah. go first. Um, well, greetings. Makwali uh, Tonali, Nochan Plata, Nochan Siwat. Greetings and, and good day, my relatives. Um, it's nice to greet you uh, on this beautiful day. So I just want to give thanks um, for the opportunity to be here with you. Thank you, Rachel, for inviting us um, and, and for the path that you walk for how you dance between uh, the mystical and and this this 3D reality here and, and do so with such grace and, and vibrancy. Thank so thank you for the inspiration that you are. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'd say, um, <laughs> I'd say I was born in a mystical state. <laughs> um, <laughs> I would agree with that. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, my mom always says you chose well, um, um, and and so my mother is is also quite a uh, a force to be reckoned with. Um, so I'm I'm so grateful that I I came into this world into this plane um, through such a powerful portal um, that that is my mother. Um, and and I was two weeks late. I, I didn't want to come out. Um, oh um, but, but when I, I finally made it in, into the world, um, you know, I, I, I came out strong and, um, when I was a child, I, I had a lot of sleep trauma, um, mm -hmm. and I would wake up, uh, many, many times a night, uh, screaming and crying and, um, and tried to kind of, you know, the family was trying to understand, mm -hmm. um, and much later in life, you know, realized that um, not everybody sees and experiences things um, the way that I do. Um, and and so when when we are these mystical beings and and we come into such a a, a solid state, um, that can be um, a bit of a bumpy road sometimes. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> that's putting it lightly <laughs> that's right um and and so when I was uh about 12 years old um I had you know started stealing cigarettes and smoking weed behind the church and um and and that kind of led me to understand um that there you know are a lot of other ways to to see things and um I would often pick up rocks and and feathers and and magical items and uh, and it was knowing that that there was a lot more out there to explore mm -hmm. um and I would um you know it was the 90s and and so people are are hanging out in coffee shops. And I used to travel one hour every day into the city um, so that I could go hang out at the coffee shop close to the, the university. Um, and it was there that I met some other young anarchist punk kids and, um, and tried acid for the first time at age 12. Um, and, and then that led me um, you know, into trying lots of other things mm -hmm. <laughs> in very rapid succession. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it was always a, a interplay um, of both these analog and digital world, these analog and digital medicines and substances, um, but always walking along my natural state which was also um, very mystical and very, very magical. Um, and, uh, you know, as a, as a teenager, 
Um, I stopped going to Catholic high school because um, everyone thought I was a witch. Um, even even the teachers and the nuns are like, you're stop scaring the other students, stop casting spells. Um, and so, you know, one lives into uh, the lives into the archetype. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, that, that led me to, to travels. And, and I went to, you know, when I was, was 18, I was like, all right, I'm going to go out into the world and, and have my first big solo, uh, international adventure. And, and that, that led me to Mali, um, where I met the Dogon people, uh, and, and traveled the escarpment at, at age 18. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and just connecting to the land um, and to the the stories and and to the drum and the music and um, you know I, I lived in Thailand for three years uh, to study uh, natural medicine and and massage and um, and study with the monks and and study from the forest itself and and you know and after traveling the world I realized well you know let me come back to my roots and uh and spent more time in Mexico and and started to learn um from my lineage um my father's Mexican um he's Nahua Tarahumara and and Spanish um and my mother's uh Australian were convict blind mm -hmm. my great grandmother I had always said she stole a sheep to feed her family but I recently found out that she stole a dress um and was deported oh my god <laughs> um so you know, there's always more to the story, um, but tapping into my own ancestral lines um, and and connecting directly with ancestors mm -hmm. um, and asking them to help assist me in my deeper understanding of self. Um, you know, I I always want to lift up my my great teacher Matsatsin, who was one of um, the first people I think to really give me some very concrete tools um, about how to understand um, myself and, and the world and the cosmos. Um, and that was the tool of, of the Aztec calendar, that Tonamashi Tonalamat. And he always says, you know, this isn't, um, this isn't a horoscope. This isn't, uh, you know, a hippie thing. It's not an Aztec thing. Uh, he's like, this is a human thing. And, and he teaches about the quality of each piece of time in which we are born um, mm -hmm. and understanding the qualities and potentials that exist in that piece of time. Um, and, and I have anyone who knows me knows that um, I have a very unique relationship to time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Shell can for sure t attest to that. And uh, and so understanding time and understanding the unique gifts that I hold um, has been something that's been very important. Um, but it, it was through a long journey of, of deep trauma and 10 years and an extremely abusive relationship in, in all of the forms, physical, mental, emotional, sexual, you know, all many forms of abuse um, that I started to uh, find a way out and back to myself again. Um, and that was through the study, um, studying herbalism and studying uh, the plants and plant medicine. Uh, and when I finally, you know, found the courage to leave, uh, it was again the the plants and uh, and Madrecita ayahuasca that actually really came into my life in a very very deep and strong way, um, and and helped me to again understand myself even deeper and and to clear and and cleanse um, some of what I was carrying on a physical level, um, and that that opened the door and opened up the way um, for so much more beauty and understanding. And, um, you know, and I, and I, I work with many other medicines and, 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 and many other traditions, but um, 
but but the marriage of those two plants um, is something that I cannot give enough thanks and respect and reverence for. Um, and and you know, throughout that journey, then I I came to meet a shell and um, you know, and and we've been carving out a strong path ever since um, and, and trying to which share. Which we'll talk about. <laughs> exactly. Which we're going to talk about. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it's now we, now we try to share some of, of what we've learned um, with others, knowing that it can be of benefit. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. And so I'll just we'll, say one, I'll yeah, just say yeah, one yeah. last thing. <clears throat> I think also, as a child, thinking back um, now, sometimes when I am in mystical states, um, I remember this thing that I used to do as a child, and and I've met other people that that did it too. And I would rub my eyes, mm-hmm. and I would just rub them and hold until I could see stars and rainbow patterns of many many colors, um, and and I would look up at light refracting down and and watch the the rainbow formulations of of light and pattern um and and it it's funny because now you know many relatives on on this medicine path that i meet um share a a, a similar story and so i think there's something to it um that that you know this this rainbow frequency does also connect us yeah yeah, totally agree. I used to do that. It's funny. I used to do that too as a kid. See? So, so yeah. to, my, to my sister. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. All right. We will go over to a shell to hear about how his, how his journey to the mystical state started. And then I want to hear how the two of you met and how you created um, the essential food and medicine. Yeah, well, thanks for having having me, having us um, be had part of this conversation. Um, it's been really cool to weave with, um, yeah, just the world of the eros and activism and looking at new way at addiction and these type of things. So, in the tantra, so um, yeah, I mean, yeah, at the beginning of the mystical. I mean. I mean, when I was reflecting off the, the the question, I really started to think back at, you know, sort of my upbringing in Chicago and also my experience with pain, actually. And then I think I think there's like an inherent like, you know, like I think these are these are like things that you can define different ways, like, you know, the mystical state, you know, like depending on who you're asking and, and what you're, you're talking about. But I remember I was getting, um, like my pops is a very big disciplinarian. He has a dick and it was a, and there was a lot of whipping for discipline. And I remember um, like a lot of my like sort of wanting to transcend or this like quest or knowing that there's something something else or something um a, like benefit for me in my, my life came out of like this feeling of like loneliness and misunderstanding and mm-hmm. and also like sort of just pain of getting like trying to do the right thing and then also simultaneously just getting like hit and yeah. you know and feeling like the whelps on my skin and crying you know uncontrollably and that's where my mind went immediately, just sitting with that, like mystical, like where where have I experienced that? And sure, I experienced, you know, you know, different aspects of beauty and, and wonder and joy as a child. Um, and obviously also part of the church too. Like so my pops was my grandfather was a part of the church. Um and my name was there for my pops as well. Or the Baptist church, and in the Baptist church, there's this periods where like there's experience of the Holy Ghost. Right. And this is about the church. It's not like a Catholic church, but it's like the people right. are dancing in the aisles. The music is going lit. And there's all these works with elements, really. And I think that's a, the syncretism of it. We can experience these things in other ways. But, 
you know, when we got baptized and they dip you in this water and you're sort of like, quote unquote, cleansed from sin, now you're reborn. These are, I mean, those are transcendent experiences that happen in different, different cultures, you know, around the world. And, but this was, this was in the church and it's like, so we're in the water and I come back up and I'm not supposed to be renewed. Right. And I was, and I took it as that. And everybody in the church took it as that when they witnessed it. And it was, and so, and so it was, you know, so, so some of these things that the mystical states are also like, you know, what we bring to the imaginal realm that we inhabit and how we interact with the symbology and interact with the energetics of it and such that it, it makes it so. So it's really, cause we inherently are of, of, of mystical quality. I mean, it's amazing that we breathe, you know, it's just like miraculous. Mm -hmm. and, and then what we can do with the breath as spirit, as inspiration is otherworldly <laughs> and yet very human and very earth, you know, very 3D. So interesting question, like these, you know, you know, these things around like the mystical states, you know, so I mean, having these experiences with my, you know, you know, with my, my pops where I'm feeling like I'm in a straight jacket and he's like screaming at me and his thyroid issue or whatever it was, was going off. And I'm like, and he's yelling at me to do something different and I can't even hear him. And I feel like I'm just like stuck and I have to like look at him screaming and just like be in tears. And what I had to go through to unpack that for years later through therapy, through ceremonies, through work, that opened up a whole new aspect of myself. Like, I'm like, oh, wow, like, who am I really underneath all the trauma that I've inherited? Mm -hmm. So, so that, that also was, you know, that created me as mystic, you know, those painful experiences, because I had to figure out how to, to be with that and how to meet that and how to feel that in a different way, such that it did, I didn't drown in it. And that I had like my humanity and I had something to offer, you know, so, I think in the Tantra, it's like, you know, all of it, you know, Tantra is all in all is Tantra. And, and so all of it is, is, you know, it's so much there. Um, so, you know, I remember one time also I was I was really into because we there was so much talk about love and, and there was so much talk about the love of Jesus. And then so I would get really interested in evil. Mm. It's like what is this evil thing then like if everything is all love and god is love then like how does evil come into play like the story of lucifer pretty peculiar in you know story you know like he was an angel of light but then he like like how did he get a different mind about him to like i'm gonna go this way like what is this so i remember that brought me to another place of like i know social talk about being called like a, a witch that brought me to another place of just like, oh, you're different. Like you're mm -hmm. trying to, you're going a different direction with it. And then really asking these questions in Sunday school, you know, I was like, wait, what, what's going on with this? How does this exist? Why is there, why do people get hurt? Why is there sin? Like all these questions and became really curious um, about all these things. And I think, you know, from there through high school, I think my relationship with the mystical became through, um, through meeting that that opposite like opposition at my curiosity, you know, I was like they were like you you're wilding asking these questions, and then also simultaneously being on being in high school and being like a creative, being an artist, but also being like a part of sports. So some of the most transcendent experiences I've experienced has been on the football field, even though I was like third string, third thread, or whatever. And I was also playing basketball too, but there's something about when you've done like the four hour practices in the summertime, you vomited, you puked, you built this camaraderie really? with people. Yeah. You know, sport, you have a sports background too. And then I ran track my junior year in high school and they used to run us so hard. We'd throw up. So hard. And when, so too, when you were talking about like rubbing your eyes, and the lights, I used, to ha I used to have that experience. And then years later, when I discovered plant medicine, 
and, and would vomit. I, I, it was the same, it was the same experience. Yeah. You know, where it's like that intensity comes ripping through your body and then you have the release. And then after the release, there's just light. Yeah. 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 And then, you know, putting it everything out on the, on the field, on the track, or, yeah. you know, you know, all out there. And then, so, you know, pushing the limits of our physicality, like, you know, it, it's very similar. It's like, okay, how far can you expand? How far mm -hmm. can you, reach? how far can your spirit expand this physical space? And then, so very similar, like sort of working with the breath, same thing as like breath work, working with the running and, you know, pulling the heart rate up, raising the vibration. And then, you know, and then also, at the end of a season, seeing how hard people worked and then just being in tears, feeling something else come into the space because we've like, you put everything out and we might have lost the game and it may be the last game of the season, but it's like, you all put it out there. Nobody kept anything to themselves. They put their whole heart, whole body, mm -hmm. whole soul. And there's something about that in the spiritualities piece where you like, you know, you give your life to God, right? This whole similar yeah. sort of cinema. And it's something like when you when we're working with these medicines and these plants, it has this request that we, oh you must surrender. You must surrender yeah. your ego <laughs> mind. You have to give it all up if you want to receive, like, you know, inherent, if you want to see the kingdom of God, right? You exactly. Want to That's exactly it. Yeah. You have to give it all up. And then it's and then so so then you can because you don't want to walk, you don't want to walk off the field. Whether that you want a loss, you want to walk off the field of life. You want that feeling of knowing that you like kept something for yourself, mm -hmm. and you you like you held something back because other people, your other teammates, this other body of of uh, the body of worship, that's that can team, that's his humanity, that's your our lives. You know the people we respect, our ancestors, all of them have done that, and then mm -hmm. so there's something really sacred about that act, and that's one time I really enacted like that level of spirituality was being like on the sports which is interesting because it's like you know it's very intense and very physical so moving from from there though that that I, I, that metaphor sort of continues like sure in church that was like the holy ghost you've seen people really go in trance like literally going in trance with the rhythm the music so that was an aspect something that got transferred over from like sort of like african spirituality incorporated into this christianity and then you got the sports aspect is the physicality and really like exasperating, like all putting yourself completely surrender. And then when I got to, uh, you know, college, University of Rochester, upstate New York, um, I really started finding like contact improv. And that really, I didn't end up doing my grad, my, my, my master's dissertation on the spirituality of contact improv, because it's a center of gravity that we're sharing and we're both actively listening. Again, it's the tantras, right? It's like the meeting. And it's like, if we're both actively meeting and we're trying to sink our like sink center of gravity together, then there's no one really leading and there's no one really, we're both following each other, we're following something. And then, so that really opened up a whole deep aspect of listening that I carry forth in the, into a sort of medicine work a lot because really a lot of the medicine work is, is about listening. It's the practice of active listening. Mm -hmm. And we may have an agendas I mean, we have our intentions, but really at the end of the day, it's like how deeply, how still can our internal waters be to feel the ripples of the, on the pond of our, of our soul, such that we become like, you know, so that we become like an influencer as well to the field, the energy field. And then, so that really opened me a lot and it got me into deep into meditation um, and got me into mantra and got me into chant. And then that's when I did my grad school studies in shamanism and Taoism um as well um but then you know even before that though like as you know family members as part of like the the black panther party i remember learning about me abu jamal and to me that was nothing more mystical and transcendent than someone who like sacrificed his life mm -hmm. to speak truth to power mm -hmm. to say like wow this is what i see about the system and it's still mm -hmm. locked up after like some 40 50 years i mean that's trippy like who does that <laughs> You know, what what kind of uh, people and saints are around us in these clothing that we call human flesh that actually have a, a, a lion inside of their chest 
that is willing to speak on behalf of others with so much veracity. Like, so that's very, that's very transcendent. And then learning about these individuals who like lost their lives, you know, to speak what they, what they thought was true, you know? So all of that sort of wraps into like the work that we, we kind of, we do now, which is, you know, working with these. Wait, wait, I want to pause because oh. I want, yeah. I want people to know how the two of you met. Okay. Cause I'm sure there is a fascinating story. Yeah. So oh, she wait, knows, you're on, um, you're on mute. <laughs> um, I can do history and then you can bring us into Esfera. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, um, Michelle and I met uh, in March of 2020 when there was a lot happening in the world, as we all know. Yeah. Um, and I had uh, I had a great big van, um, and I had seen on a on a signal chat on a mutual aid thread a call out for um, people to help with transportation of surplus food. Um, mm -hmm. There were the uh, Oakland Unified School District was giving away food bags um, to the students' families and, the, and they had excess um, and it was being redistributed to uh, our unhoused relatives or mm -hmm. the, the home, quote unquote homeless population. And uh, we like to say that nobody is ever without a home, that your home is, is here, is your heart, is your body. Um, and uh, so I started uh, redistributing this food um, and, and along the way, you know, met, met some different folks that were organizing and uh, I wasn't really super into their style of organizing um, and wasn't feeling, you know, deeply connected in community. And so I had mentioned this to my therapist um, and my therapist says, Oh, you know, I know this, I know this, uh, I know this man, this guy's, he's, he's, you know, oh kind of similar to you. And, you know, he does, does kind of similar stuff. Um, you know, I'm going to give you this referral and, and, you know, perhaps he can lead you in a good direction. You guys could collaborate. And, um, and when I saw, uh, you know, and so a few weeks go by and I haven't really contacted him and I'm in therapy again and she you know and I'm complaining and she says well did you reach out to the person you know to to the contact and I said no um and she's like you know I think you might like really like him I think it would be a good connection and and I said um okay so so then I look at his Instagram and I see a shell playing the ngoni under a tree in Japan and the ngoni is um is Got the it. hunter's <laughs> is the hunter's harp um and and i looked at him and i said "Ooh, that's trouble um but i i knew that um you know there was uh mm. that there was that there was a connection a strong connection there karmic connection yeah it sounds very like. strong yeah. yeah and um and so a shell came to my house and we were building um hand washing stations that day and and wow. And he came in and um, and there was so much reflection, mm -hmm. um, sacred reflection in in some of our motivations and and political and spiritual ethos and beliefs. Um, you know, I was uh, I where I grew up very close to where Mumia Abu Jamal was in prison, mm -hmm. um, and and that was how I really started doing activism work as a, a youngster and a shell had just come back from Mali, um, mm. which I shared earlier was yeah. a big part of my, um, my journey. And, and so there were so many reflections and, and mirrors. Um, and, uh, he had been, uh, juicing and, and delivering, juice and medicinal mushrooms and all sorts of things um to people to support their um their immune systems at that time mm -hmm. um and you know here I was doing this food recovery thing and um and I ended up getting I was you know inspired and 
And so I, I asked uh, a local food bank for a donation and I got like wall to wall boxes of, of fruits and vegetables. And I called him up the next day and I said, Hey, you know, I, I got all these, these donations like for you to make your juice. And he comes over and he looks and he's like, he's like, well, <laughs> like, I don't know what I'm going to do with all of this. Um, and so we, we just started juicing it. Um, mm. and it, it took a few days and, and we turned it into soup. Um, and that took another few days. And, um, and that year we, um, fed thousands of people and supported wow. the health of thousands of people. Um, and, and that, that year, I think we perhaps spent seven days apart, um, and and so we within the first week of meeting each other um really felt the call to greater service mm. and um and we founded uh, essential food and medicine that that same week um because we knew that the problems that people um were facing were not unique to um the pandemic um moment that they weren't unique to um to that that specific moment in time that they were a response to larger political systems mm -hmm. of oppression and inequality and um both on a systemic level of justice and also um on on a level of of people's health um and and their bodies and 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 not just their physical bodies, but also their emotional and spiritual bodies as well. Um, and so we were transforming food waste uh, th that, you know, food that would otherwise be finding its way to the landfill um, and and making juices and smoothies. And I was an herbalist and we were making natural medicines and mm. and getting donations from people's backyards. And uh, so had a gleaning program, a composting program. Uh, and, and when we would create the juice, um, you know, a shell does a, a, a form of spiritual purification, um, called Sukyo Marikari, um, Japanese lineage. And, and so he would pray over the juice and, and inside the kitchen, you know, there were people literally from all walks of life, you know, there were Trump supporters and, and ardent, yeah. you know, anarchists all coming together to, to make this, this liquid love, this medicine. Mm. Um, and then I would go out into the encampments in, in the big old van and, and deliver, hand deliver it to people, um, which is also medicine, um, mm -hmm. that being in direct community with someone, you know, knowing their name, coming back day after day, um, and creating herbal medicines that could support their unique situations like, you know, teeth infections, chronic diarrhea, um, you know, um, skin infections, things that, that our unhoused relatives, uh, you know, really live with. And, and that I think those of us that have the privilege to live inside um, can take for granted just how running water and soap and and yeah. access to to a bathroom and a shower, um, you know, can can really make a huge difference for people. Um, and so it was actually um, some of our our relatives that came to us and they said, "Hey, you know, we have this idea. We see what you guys do. Um, we had done a thing called What's Your Medicine, and and we had brought." 30 different kinds of, of holistic healers, um, to, uh, underneath a freeway and we cleaned it up and, you know, got rid of the abandoned cars and, and the needles on the ground and, um, and had th this big kind of, uh, health fair, uh, and, and concert. And so they'd seen that work and they said, um, we'd like to build a, a communal kitchen. Uh, can you help us? And, and so we ended up building not just that, but uh, a health clinic, a free store, mm. a stage, garden, showers, composting toilets, all, all sorts of things. Um, we called it Cobb on Wood because um, mm -hmm. that area was called Wood Street. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and you guys actually, Unconditional Freedom, yeah. uh, donated 
lots of of fresh fruits and vegetables and and so you know it really does uh take the the love and and passion and and prayer of so many um yeah. to affect so many such a huge problem um and and that work um you know when when caltrans and and uh, which is the california department of transportation um, whose land we were inhabiting, when they displaced people onto city land, and then the city land, you know, continued to tear down our buildings and and displace people. Um, it really shifted a lot of things, not just in our work, um, but in the lives of the people that we were serving. And um, and Leger Harper, who is uh, our our, she calls us her her spiritual mother and father. Um, but who you you got to meet during yeah, the art of addiction training um she decided she wanted to get clean from fentanyl um and and after almost dying in her daughter's car um her daughter brought her to to our house and um and we helped her kick fentanyl and meth and and with the assistance of the ancestral medicines that we work with um you know, there's another arm of the work called Celestial Church, which, you know, Michelle can expand on. And, and we yeah, do. I was going to I was actually yeah. going to ask you guys if you would talk more about it. It's we're likely going to have to do part two because we're near we're sadly nearing the end of the hour. But I, I would love for you guys to just briefly, if you can talk about the church and the work that 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 you do with that. And I don't I mean, I don't know how much time we have, but you, you do a lot with ritual and ceremony and music also. And I thought if you guys are open, I thought a cool way we could end was the way that you guys used to open the art of addiction sessions with the music. It was one of the most powerful things for me during the weekend was having you guys do that. And so if you're open to that, I'd love to actually end the podcast like that. And then I'd love to do part two, if you guys are open to it. Absolutely. Sure. Okay. Michelle, do you want to take uh take it from here? Yeah, yeah. So there's um well one thing to say is that like, you know, it was, you know, the beginning of the pandemic, we, you know, seven days in we essential food and medicine created. And I think one thing we noted was that there was like essential workers and there was essential there was things that were being deemed essential. There's mm -hmm. certain things open, certain things being closed. And we were like, Well, isn't there like essential there's food is essential, like, you know, medicines are essential and why why aren't they being prioritized so then that required that prompted a deeper inquiry into the moment that brought us to the the clarity that there is there is a spiritual war happening so there's like a physical that there's like a spiritual war that's going on so we require more organization so now we have a sfeta so feta has three pillars one is you know essential food and medicine which now has a holistic detox recovery program because we we were realizing we can only do so much addiction defense. I think that was a really, really big moment when you, a really good phrase you shared, Rachel, that was about that I, that I use now actually because it's so appropriate. He was like, well, now what we do with activism as it is stands, sometimes it's like we're moving furniture, trying to move furniture around in the sinking Titanic, mm -hmm. right? And then, but but the wild, the the magic, where does the magic exist to actually create transformation, the distinction between change and transformation, mm -hmm. right? Like what's really gonna shift things? So I think that's where we were sort of in that inquiry. I was like, wow, we have the systems in decay. We have these things. It's not just about the virus or not just about this, who's this particular you know person in the office. There's something else that's underneath that's that we're co-creating this existence. Where's the magic at? So I think that's what came out of that. And then it required like the firepower of like, okay, we're really gonna go and do the transformation work. We need celestial church. We need the ceremonial aspects. We need the allyship with these, the the spiritual realm, the gods, mm. the the devis. You know, we need to be in alignment with that which is actually impacting things more than just our vote. You know, <laughs> these things are impacting things like all the time, right here, right now. On deeper level, how do we actually work with the land as an ally? How do we work with, um, you know, the people's inner demons? You know, how do we work with these things directly and be in communion with them? 
right? So that we can get to that. So that's Celestial Church, a big part of that, like we shared, elemental activism, rights of repair, uh, relational rituals for collective embodied liberation, which, you know, has tracks that deals with, you know, movement perspectives around, like, how do we actually, you know, work differently in, in be you know, more in, in emotionally intelligent to, like, the animistic reality of things versus just reacting to everything and then how do we be more be in like a more sovereign maturity actually versus like the sort of adolescent phase of like otherization in like sort of shame blame these back and forth things and trying to get power and energy from a system that's doing the same thing trying to get power and energy from like our fear and our reaction right like it's like okay well that's a different way of doing this to actually create ultimate freedom and liberation do our business. So so that, that that became like celestial church, um, more or less. And then Earth Amplified is more the documentary. So we're filming the J. It's right. more the media arm. So that's um one, you know, under indigenous roots, the indigenous origins of psychedelic culture. Uh like a, a line of that story is added to activists, which we're we're actively like sort of working with the J on right now to film her journey, which because I think what ultimately like her what she's doing who she is says everything you know like her journey and if we were, we're like okay we, we're creating access with these medicines and these plants like to re, have people remember their own indigenous roots to, in connection to these these medicines these pathways like miss no one has ownership of mystical state and mm-hmm. the mystical state is is can healing it be healing but also it's just like an exploration it's expansion it's a yeah. it, Visual into like who are we really, and then who are we really? The inquiry can lead to healing for sure. It's like a, almost yeah. like a byproduct, you know. But like the ultimate like sickness we have is is one of lack of imagination. It's one of a lack of of understanding of the self, you know. We we've over identified and misidentified with like things that have been that have hijacked our destiny. You know. Yeah, it's like uh, it's like Drupan Chungwal says you have to relax your sense of self. Yes. Right? The whole thing. And and you know, we all know this from medicine journeys, right? It's relax, 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 which is actually the same. exactly, <laughs> which is the same thing in orgasmic meditation or you know, really any erotic practice. And it it seems so counterintuitive, but it's it's ultimately the thing that always opens is re- relax, 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 mm-hmm. relax, relax. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. So if we find like, okay, wow, we have to like fight these things. We have to always be in fight. Like that's the the thing we have to fight. We have to fight the fight. And then we're like, you know, tr- you know, projecting our trauma and spin like, are we really creating a positive change? So these are the questions we're asking. I was like, well, I don't know if this is really even effective to keep running this hamster wheel and like being like in this, this, this ant death march as our friend, like um, the bio economy always they points out. Is like we're in this ant dark death march. So it became like a bigger question. The moment provided a bigger question. And it was like, what better person to ally with from the social who sort of gets you have these really so that, let's let's go deep into it. So I feel really blessed to have the opportunity to actually explore those things and go deeper into the work and in action with it. Um and also provide, you know, access, right, to people to really like, wow, like, you know, one the other day we were in a ceremony with with um, you know, with the uh, there was some purification work with um, LeJay and she was having this realization. She's like, wow, like a lot of times we actually create more problems. And I net noted, I, I want to bring it back to her because she, that was something that, that sort of went under the radar a little bit. She's like, yeah, sometimes we actually create more problems sometimes. And, and we like, if we, we always blame and we otherize a lot and we like point the finger and all these things. But it's like, there's a level of just like, you know, no one can write, my pops would always say, no one can ride our back unless we bent over and like and how are we bent bent over like what what power are we giving away by not really being truly ourselves and like really reclaiming ourselves so i thought that was really powerful because that was something i was like really about at the beginning i was like okay we can we can't sustain this type of like activity forever like you know we can't do this and actually get the results that we really want in terms of like trans- transformation, changing our communities, uplifting each other in this way. So I think the medicines and the access to the mystical and the experience of that changes everything. It sort of really quickly reminds me of the story down in Watts 
I was working with this woman who did, um, she had uh, drawn a global heart, this organization, um, Bellevue Rooks, and they're working with gang members in the Watts. Mm -hmm. And one thing they did to transform this turf identification and like these type of like sort of like allegiances that may be like sort of more temporal um, of a, sort of this over identifications that like they started showing people what Timothy Leary show it was seen, it was shown at, at one point um, with some of our like sort of sort of psychonaut leadership was shown was like the earth when in the 60s that was something that really came into the the newer sphere. Yeah. You know, it was like you could see the earth for the first time from the outside of the earth. And sure, those societies of people and beings who've seen so much of the universe through different mystical journeys and a lot of indigenous peoples. But the, the world at large can see like, oh, we live on a floating orb flying through space at like high rates. And we're we have our particular problems and our things that we are identifying with and the people that we hate and our licks and dislikes and all those things. And then but yet. So by some miracle, this is what's happening. And then so they showed people this and that became like a, a mystical state for them. I mean, it came with a transformative moment where they were able to look and see themselves anew in relationship to people that they have been warring with, right? You have the different terms, different gangs, et cetera. And, and then how she introduced that was like mind blowing to me. I was like, wow, like we really, um, you know, that that in itself was was a, a moment of of a meditation to see this orb yeah. in the same way we see like a dot on the wall in space when we're doing a yogic practice that be opened up this whole different possibility from them in terms of their consciousness. So whereas our consciousness be you know became the the, the battlefield mm -hmm. for for and where and what is awareness for us became more of like the front lines of the the quote unquote spiritual war that we're in. And I think Esfera we try to cover all those spaces, you know, in terms of the media. Yeah, they're doing good work. <laughs> and then also yeah. people's material needs directly, right? Yeah. Like we need to neutrify ourselves. Yeah. yeah. So maybe okay, house. so maybe part two of our podcast will be uh maybe we'll call it like a central essential ritual and ceremony or something. Yeah. 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 And then if you guys want, and only if you want. Um, I thought it'd be so cool for you to end with your music stuff that you do, your music medicine that you do. Okay, cool. Sure. I was just thinking about what a essential ritual medicine is Iraq. I was like, I was thinking, I was like, did that work? Essential ritual and ceremony, yeah, Iraq. Um, so, Rochelle, do you want to um, open up with, with, uh, with your with the I don't know if you have your bell um but you could do that and then we could just go into way papalot yeah um yeah I would have to like grab, that's okay yeah maybe you just maybe you you open and then we go into way papalot and I can I'll I'll start way uh huh okay okay cool well I think what I'll share is like I'll just share like a little chant and then um. And it's just like what we, since you've been referencing that, it's like something I re rely on a lot, like this particular word sound power of the Koto Dhamma of the Matsu prayer from Suki Marikari. And then this is a purification chant and the age of fire, as we increase in the age of fire, which is like, as we see witness all around us, which exposes a lot and burns a lot of karma, actually the great cleansing um, that we're experiencing um, to this age and assist in that effort. So, Goku Biji so gin gin shikai takamani kamu to my mue de masu. Go murugi kamurumi no machi karamachi te. Bang se to eto no mio ya kamu matsu sano my karyo mi kami. Harido no kamu tachi. Moramura no sakaka do to my no sutsumiki gario ba my karimote. Arai kiyome misugi to my te kimono kono chikara yiminge we say to my to. Motsu kotono yoshio kashimi kashimi mo mautsu. 
For the spirit of transformation, we sing to the butterfly, to our sacred and beloved Pue Papa Lord. And we say, So I will text you and we will do part two. And thank you for doing this. It was a deep pleasure. Mm, thank you, Rachel. What a joy to be with you. Yeah. Love you guys. Yeah. We love you. This has been a podcast of Journey into the Mystic. Join me again for my next guest soon. <laughs>